Super Bowl Sunday morning? Woo, let me hear you. Yes, all right. Well, we are all here to enjoy this glorious day together. If you could all please stand up and give a wink or a wave to those around you. And let's all get ready to worship this morning. Come on, sing this song with me this morning.
Thanks. Good morning, church. How's everyone doing today? Well, great. 
Good, so glad to hear it. Want to say welcome also to those of you who are joining us online and streaming the service. So glad that you have found us on the internet. Want to invite you if you are new to Crossroads, so maybe you're visiting us for the first time and you're here in the room, maybe you've just found us for the first time. Want to invite you to connect with our church. Uh, we would love to, uh, to help you grow wherever you happen to be on your spiritual journey. We are a group of imperfect people who are learning how to follow Jesus together, and we would love to invite you onto the journey uh, with us and connect with you. Um, speaking of connecting, want to encourage you, if you have any prayer needs in your life for you or the people you love, we have a group of folks here who would be blessed to be praying with you uh, this week, and you can send in that prayer uh, request right now by texting it to the number that you see on the screen, and that will go confidentially to our prayer team, and they will start praying for you literally right now uh, at this moment, um, and, then, and then throughout the week. Also want to let you know that we have some online small groups that are kicking off this month. We've got a group called Alpha that's going to get ready to start up tomorrow, and then we've got a whole bunch of other groups that are getting ready to start. They're called road trip groups because the next message series that we're getting ready to launch into in a couple of weeks is called road trip. Crossroad is going on a road trip in a year when a lot of us weren't able to do road trips. So we're going to do it right here at church. And the way it'll work is we are going to take a road trip through the book of Psalms, which is a, a collection of ancient prayers and wisdom and poetry and hymns. And it's amazing. And it will change your life. It already has and it will change it all over again. And so we are going to, to dive into the book of Psalms and experience that together. And we are putting together uh, content for groups to go even further than where we can go just in the half hour or so I can teach on it on Sunday mornings. So you, I want to encourage you to jump into those groups. If you're watching online, there's a link. Uh, if you're here in the room, you just see what's on the screen right there. You go to, it's at the bottom, it's crossroad.church and then slash groups. So you just go to our website and you'll find it uh, from there. want to encourage you to jump into uh, one of those groups. It'll be great. Also want you to know that I'm in a great mood this morning. You wouldn't think that I was because Kentucky, my alma mater, the Kentucky Wildcats lost to the horrible University of Tennessee by like some embarrassing score. I think our record is now five and 12. It's the first time we've been this bad since Moses walked the earth. I know, losing to, I know, losing to Tennessee, it's almost as bad as losing to the University of Florida. Not quite, but it's close. And I was blessed before the service with this beautiful UK wreath. Isn't this, isn't this amazing? So who, who actually made it? Because I know both of you guys gave, you made it together. Okay, can we give them a hand? Can you wave your hands in the air right there? Thank you so much. I love this. Ah, all right. So now I'm ready to preach. And before I do that, let's pray together. Let's pray. Jesus, your name is not only beautiful, it's also powerful. What a powerful name. What power we find, what life we find in you. And so we turn our eyes upon you, Jesus, and we want to look full in your wonderful face this morning so that the things of earth that we dragged in through the doors with us this morning, that they can fade in the light of your glory and your grace. Amen. So we are finishing up a series uh, today called Asking for a Friend. We've been looking at the kinds of questions. These are the kinds of questions that are on all of our minds. They're on everyone's minds, but these are also the kinds of questions that can feel a little awkward or even just embarrassing to voice these questions or ask them aloud. It's the kind of questions where sometimes we feel like, oh, I don't even know if I'm supposed to have that, that question. If I'm a, quote, good Christian, then maybe I shouldn't have that question. That's what the series is. And before we get to today's question, let me remind us, especially if you're just kind of jumping in today, is that we don't need to be embarrassed or afraid of our, of our questions. I've been trying to reframe that over the past uh, several weeks, is that people who are Christ followers, like you and me, we should be extremely curious and hungry to grow and to, and to learn, and even to embrace our questions. Uh, the, there are so many people over the years who have shared with me that their faith actually grew by leaps and bounds in the midst of some very complex and difficult questions uh, about faith and life and all of it. See, questions actually can have power. See, there's some very important moments in my own story, in my biography. There are some very important moments where it's been defined by a life-altering question. Let me give you some examples. On, on February 14th, 2003, yes, it was uh, Valentine's Day that we'll celebrate in a week. Guys, there's your public service announcement. 
It's in a week. It's in a week. On February 14, 2003, I dropped to one knee and I asked Ashley, who's sitting right over there, this question, will you marry me? And she said, yes. I know you're shocked, but she did. She said, yes. Very thankful for that answer. A few months later, Ashley and I both had to answer some questions. We stood before our family and friends in a church and our pastor asked us if we would be faithful to each other for rich or for poor, in sickness and in health, for better, for worse, to cherish each other, to have and to hold until we're parted by death. Then on January 18th, 2006, another defining moment in my story because a nurse handed me my newborn daughter, placed her in my arms and asked me this parenthood, fatherhood question. It was the first time I'd ever been asked this question actually. What name is given this child? It's a question that changed my life forever. Here's another one. On June, oh, by the way, that baby girl is currently studying to get her learner's permit. Oh, oh, I don't even know what to do with that. All right, next one. June 11th, 2012, a few days after I graduated from seminary, I stood before the Kentucky Annual Conference, and my bishop asked me a series of questions. They were my ordination vows that I took. And after I answered the questions, I knelt at an altar. He laid his hands on me, along with uh, Ashley, my wife, and a group of mentors, people who had helped to shape me and form me. They all laid hands on me, and I was ordained to serve the church as a pastor. Those questions, those ordination vows, have shaped the trajectory and will always for the rest of my life. These are just some of the life-changing questions that have, have shaped me into the person who I am uh, today. And the question we're looking at today, I gave you those examples because this question, today's question, the one we're going to finish up the series on, this question is so powerful that this question, maybe more than any of the other questions in the series, has the potential to determine the course and trajectory of the rest of your life and my too. So here's our question. Are you ready for it, church? One person is. <laughs> All right, can we all say the question out loud? One, two, three, go. Is there life after death? Now, I don't know for certain because I haven't been to the other side yet. I imagine that you haven't either. However, we did some research and the mortality rate is still hovering right around 100%. And so this is a question that has crossed all of our minds. We have all wondered this question at one time or another, but in this environment, in, in, in a church, I've learned over the years that it can be a question that for sometimes, for some people, it can feel kind of awkward or even embarrassing to admit the question that it's something we're even wondering about. Because I think there's kind of this sneaky little thing, you know, in the underbelly of the system somewhere that good Christians aren't supposed to wonder about this, that they're just supposed to assume and take for granted that of course there's an afterlife, because I learned that in Sunday school, and the Bible says, and we sing songs, in fact, we just sang a couple of songs about that, so we should just kind of take that for granted. Well, you might be surprised to know that God's people have not always been so sure about the answer to this question. Now, before you run for the exits and accuse me of heresy, you got to promise you you're going to stay with me, church. I'm taking us on a journey this morning, so can you stay with me? Stay with me for a few minutes. God's people have not always been so sure about the answer to this question. So I'm going to take us to the Bible and show you why I say that the answer is no. God's people have not always been kind of 100% certain that there is life after death. I'm taking us, it's a great story. It's found in Mark chapter 12. It's also recorded in a couple of other of the different uh, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or the four gospels, the stories that we have of Jesus' life. I'm taking us to the account that's in Mark chapter 12. It's a day when a group of religious experts, they try to trip Jesus up with a trick question. Now, this group, they belong, these experts, they belong to, uh, it was this sect within uh, first century Judaism called the Sadducees. They were experts, by the way, in the Hebrew Bible. They were highly regarded and esteemed teachers of the law of Moses. They had concluded, based on their understanding of the Hebrew Bible, that there was no afterlife. Look with me at verse 18. We'll bring it up on the screen. Then the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a, what's the last word you see in the line? Question. With a question. That's right. <laughs> so these guys were brave enough. They weren't asking for a friend. They were asking for themselves. 
So then the Sadducees, what they're going to do is they're going to try to lay a trap for Jesus in the form of this trick question. And here's what they ask him. Let's go to verse 19 and go to the next slide. Jesus, uh, I'll read it for us. It might not be in the slides. So verse 19, here's what they ask him. Teacher, Moses gave us a law that if a man dies, leaving a wife without children, his brother should marry the widow and have a child who will carry on the brother's name. Now, I know all of us modern people are like, ew, no, whatever. But so let me time out. Let me explain some of the context here. This is an ancient society and world where uh, women tragically, it was a patriarchal society, uh, and women tragically were not allowed to inherit or even own uh, property. And so this was a desperate circumstance. If a married man uh, was survived uh, by a widow, something had to be done. That This thing that I, I just read for us, this idea that, that if uh, a, ma a married man died and, and had a brother who was living, that uh, the widow would be taken into the brother's uh, home. It was mainly designed as a protection so that uh, widows wouldn't end up on the street, that they would be uh, cared for. All right, so back to the story. So here's, we're going to keep going with their trick question. Verse 20, here's what they proposed to Jesus. Well, suppose there were seven brothers. The oldest one married and then died without children. So the second brother married the widow, but he also died without children. Then the third brother married her. This continued with all seven of them, and still there were no children. Last of all, the woman boarded a train in Los Angeles, headed towards Chicago at 60 miles an hour. No, I'm kidding. That's not what the Bible says. <laughs> Then they say in their little riddle, last of all, the woman also died. I mean, can you blame her? Passed down a line with seven, ugh, seven brothers. All right, verse 23. So then here comes the moment. They think they've trapped Jesus. So tell us, you know, rabbi who believes in the resurrection. So tell us, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? For all seven were married to her. Now the Sadducees, they're that kid in your high school who drove you nuts because he always just wanted to argue about all of that stupid stuff. The Sadducees, of course, were just sad, you see. <laughs> Wade, that one was for you, buddy. <laughs> but notice what the Sadducees are doing here. They are intentionally ignoring uh, the spirit of the law of Moses. They're intentionally ignoring the intent behind the law, just focusing in on the letter of the law, so that they can make a bigger point, that there is no life after death. See, in their minds, it's impossible. They just can't compute for human relationships like you and I enjoy here on earth. They cannot compute that human relationships would be like a carbon copy of that and work in heaven the way that they do here on earth. And so therefore, there must be no such thing as heaven. And here's how Jesus responds to their riddle. So Jesus replies, oh good, we do have this on the screen, all right. So Jesus replies, are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? Oh, oh. <laughs> when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. And one sentence, he dismisses their entire thing. But Jesus isn't finished using this as a teaching opportunity. You've got to listen to this part that comes next. He says, now, about the dead rising. Have you not read in the book of Moses? Remember, these guys are the, quote, experts in the law of Moses. Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the account of the burning bush, which is the, one of the most famous stories in all of the Hebrew Bible, how God said to him, to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, God identifies himself to Moses by being the God of three people who had been dead for a long, long time. And look at this next line. Jesus says, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then, here comes the mic drop. You are badly mistaken. Oh. So in front of all of their fanboys, Jesus looks at the Sadducees. It reminds me of that old knight in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. You chose poorly. <laughs> now, the sin of the Sadducees, their big error is that they focused in on half of a line uh, from, from the book of Moses. When I was in seminary, my professors cautioned us against this when we would prepare sermons. They, they have a word for this. They call this proof texting. Where, so what the Sadducees were doing is they were lifting out half of a line from the law of Moses, stripping it of all of its meaning and its context, twisting it inside and out, and then using that as a justification for their conclusion that the afterlife just cannot exist. In other words, they had, they had lost sight of a giant forest because they were so focused in on 
a twig. And so Jesus reminds the Bible experts what the Bible actually says. God is the God of life. God is the God of the living. And you and I, of course, are created by the God of life. Uh huh. So you see where we're going, church? So it's no wonder that eternal life is on our minds. It's no wonder we're curious about that. Guys, the next time this pops into your mind, and even if you feel a little awkward, like, ooh, should I even be wondering if there's an afterlife or not? You don't need to be afraid of that question that comes up. You know why? It's your factory programming. <laughs> Eternal life is stamped and imprinted into you because you are created by the God of life, God of the living. There's this ancient book of wisdom in our Bibles. It's written by an unknown author. Listen to this verse from Ecclesiastes. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. Listen to this next line. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. See, our ancient spiritual ancestors, they understood that there's going to be an element of mystery to this. You and I are living on the other side of heaven, on the other side of eternity. And yet it's imprinted and planted within us. It's our default factory programming. This is why I wonder about these kind of things, but my dog does not. My dog is mainly uh, worried about the thunderstorm we had yesterday afternoon. He ain't worried about heaven and hell. <laughs> For him, hell is the thunderstorm and heaven is when it stops. And I think there's one place in particular where our topic today comes to the forefront of every single person's mind. And that's at a funeral, a celebration of someone's life, a memorial service. Now in my line of work, uh, I've, I've been at one or two funerals over the years. And I found this universally to be true. Regardless of someone's um, faith background or even lack thereof, it's on the forefront of every person's mind. What exactly happens to us after we take our last breath? This is why I'm fascinated by what happens when Jesus walks up on the in-progress funeral ceremonies. We actually have a story of Jesus attending a funeral. It's for one of his dearest friends in the world, a man named Lazarus. Jesus was well acquainted not only with Lazarus, but with his two sisters. Their names were Mary and Martha. They lived in Bethany. Bible scholars think that Jesus possibly visited their home several times, maybe even kind of one of his home bases while he would go, you know, travel around teaching and healing people. So Lazarus gets sick and he dies very suddenly. His sister Martha is just distraught and broken to pieces in her grief after her brother Lazarus has died. Now, I personally can relate to Martha's pain. I've shared with you before some of that journey for me after I lost my little brother Keith unexpectedly uh, a few years ago. I can relate to Martha's pain in a personal way. So listen to these words that Jesus says to Martha in her grief that I also have found great comfort in in my own grief. This is John 11. I'll read for you verses 25 and 26. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Now, the words I've just read... I have been a follower of Jesus for a couple of decades now. I've known these words for a long time. But something interesting has happened. This often happens for me with the words in the Bible, is that I can read a story again and again and again and again, a hundred times, a thousand times, and God still teaches me new things. And these verses I just read for you, as familiar as they are, they've changed for me a little bit uh, in recent days and years. See, I've never really paid that much attention to the way that Jesus concludes his promise. How Jesus ends it with a question. Do you see the question on the screen? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, Kevin? Now, for me, yes, there's days when my faith is very strong and days when it's not quite as strong, but for me, the answer has, has always been, has been yes. Do you believe this, Kevin? Yes, Jesus, I believe. But these days, I find myself saying it with a little more force with a little more weight with with 
uh, a little more urgency. And the only way I can explain that is to say that something uh, changed in my soul when I said goodbye to my grandfather and to my grandmother, and especially when I said goodbye to Keith, all of whom believers in the resurrection and the life and the power of Jesus. I just find myself answering that question. That's all I can say to you, church. I just answer it a little different these days. Do you believe this, Kevin? Yes. Yes. I believe with all my heart. Now, the Bible describes... Let me stop. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. (laughs) Are you wondering or even worried today about what happens after you take your last breath on earth? You don't need to be worried any longer. Friends... I don't care if this is your first time in church. I don't care if you thought, you know, the reason we got the thunderstorm is because you came to church and God's trying to cave it in because you're here. I don't care. You don't have to be worried anymore. Jesus is the resurrection and the life and invites all people, even if you've never even picked this book up before, invites all people. Jesus says today is the day of salvation right now. (laughs) You don't have to take a class first. Jesus invites all people to place their faith, their trust in him, to receive this gift of eternal life. Do you need to receive that today? Is God going to work on you in some way that I don't even know about (laughs) right now? All right, I'm sorry, time in, back to the sermon. So, and we're going to come back to that in a second. The Bible describes what this next life is like uh, with different words. So the Bible uses words like heaven and paradise. The Bible describes it as a wedding feast. The Bible describes it as a banquet table. And I think because the Bible uses these different kinds of word pictures, what that does, I think, is it gives us permission to imagine. It gives us permission to imagine. What is heaven like? What could it be like? Here's one vision. It's from a a modern contemporary author named Randy Alcorn. He loves to write about heaven. And and I want to read for you a a passage uh, he wrote. Uh, It's not on the screen. I'll just read it for us. He imagines uh, heaven this way. No death and no suffering. No funeral homes, abortion clinics, or psychiatric wards. No rape, missing children, or drug rehabilitation centers. No bigotry or racism. No muggings or killings. No worry or depression or economic downturns. No wars, no unemployment. No anguish over failure and miscommunication. No con men and no locks. No death. No mourning, no pain, no boredom, no arthritis, no handicaps, no cancer, no taxes, amen, no bills, no computer crashes, no weeds, no bombs or missiles, no drunkenness, no traffic jams or accidents, no septic tank backups, no mental illness, no unwanted emails, hallelujah, close friendships, but no clicks, laughter, but no put downs. Intimacy, but no immorality. No hidden agendas, no backroom deals, no betrayals. Imagine mealtimes full of laughter, stories, and joy without fear of insensitivity, inappropriate behavior, anger, gossip, lust, jealousy, hurt feelings, or anything else that eclipses joy. That will be heaven. Whew, what a beautiful vision. And of course, all of this made possible because the Bible promises us that yes, there is an element of imagination and mystery, but there are some points the Bible is very crystal clear on. (laughs) That heaven, life after death in Jesus, that it's being completely in the presence of God. In other words, to be absent from our body is to be present with the Lord. Now that brings us to the other side of this discussion. Because what about the possibility of not being in God's presence? after we die. And I know this is a hard thought of being completely separated from God's unconditional love. It's a horrifying thought. And so, of course, the Bible uses a horrifying word to describe that unimaginable reality, hell. Jesus himself refers to hell multiple times in his own teaching, accompanied with an urgent plea for his followers to not waste any time, not waste any time, Not to seize the day, seize this moment in surrendering our lives completely to the will of God. The one who, of course, desires for all people 
to be saved and rescued and redeemed. After all, this is why Jesus came to earth. Do I wish that there was no such thing as hell? Of course I wish there wasn't such a thing. But on this point, I'm going to share with you, church, where I am today personally in my understanding uh, by quoting um, someone who came before me. His name is C.S. Lewis. This is what he said about hell. I agree. There is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and specifically of our Lord's own words. Our Lord's own words words. Now I know that some of you, because you shared with me, uh, come from a religious background where there was a lot of shame and condemnation. Uh, some of you have shared with me just stories that have turned my stomach about coming from places where uh, you were told that you were going to hell because of this, that, or the other, or one of your loved ones was in hell because of whatever, because not baptized in a certain way or, or prayed in the wrong way or not in a certain uh, way or, or because apparently there was some lifestyle choice or sin that was just somehow unforgivable or whatever, whatever it might be. First, let me say, I am so thankful that after that harm and damage was done to your soul, I am so thankful that today you're giving church another chance. Crossroad, aren't we thankful that they're here, that they're worshiping with us and watching online? This is a community that is founded on the firm foundation of Jesus' teaching about the amazing grace and unconditional love of God available to all of us. And in our Lord's own words, what I would say to those of you who have kind of had the condemnation and the shame heaped on you is uh, people who've done that to you They've forgotten our Lord's own words, who says that God the Father alone has final authority over all of these matters, and that Christ followers, Christians, are prohibited from judging the fate of other people. Instead, in our Lord's own words, he tries to free us from this burden of judging other people and to focus instead on the fate of our own soul and the condition of our own Lives. Remember, in our Lord's own words spoken to Martha and to you and me today, everyone who lives in Jesus and believes in Jesus will never, ever die. And so again, like I said before, if you have some worry or concern and need some assurance today about what happens to you after you take your last breath on earth, look no further. Jesus stands at the ready to bring heaven and fill your heart with salvation today and set you free for this life and for the life to come. No matter where you've been, no matter where you're going, no matter where you find yourself today, salvation is now. Salvation is today. Salvation is for you and it's for me. And this is such a wonderful promise. Ooh, but I got some time left. Because that's good. Because it's even better than we think. Because, all right, I'm going to try. <laughs> this promise is even better than we think. Because, church, I cannot share with you today the Bible's promises about the afterlife and about heaven without taking us all the way. See, this promise is so much better than we think because Jesus doesn't just teach us about the life to come. He actually teaches us about this life right now, too. In fact, when you add it all up, the words that Jesus devoted to talking about the afterlife and about eternal life, yes, he teaches us about these things, and I'm so glad he does. They actually pale in comparison, though, as far as quantity and volume. Jesus spends by far much of his time teaching us not about the life that's to come, but about this life right now. See, from a Jesus perspective, eternal life, it's not something that begins after you take your last breath. Eternal life begins with your next breath. Let me say that again. Eternal life is not something that waits to start until you take your last breath. No, eternal life, from Jesus' teaching and perspective, eternal life begins with your next breath right now. Now, is there life after death? We go to the next slide. Yes, there is, because God offers me eternal life with him. Would you say the last part out loud? Go. Now and forever. Now and forever. With Jesus, there is life after death, but it gets better because there is life before death, too. Do you remember the old uh, children's lullaby? If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. What a traumatizing lullaby to sing to children, by the way. Anyway, yeah, it's scary if you think about it. But reverse that. 
what happens if I should wake before I die? Uh, see, with Jesus, there's life after death, yes. But there's also life before death. And this question, like I said, is there life after death? Yes, it's a life-changing, life-determining question. I want to suggest two reasons, two ways this becomes true for us. First, eternal life now, it means that I can love others well. Love others well. Would you say those three words out loud? Go. Love others well. This gift of eternal life, remember, it's for this life too. One of the greatest missionaries of the early church, a man named Paul, he wrote a letter to the Christ followers who were in Rome, and he gave them very clear instructions about how they should be living their lives differently now based on the promise of what was coming later. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. See, Paul's calling us to love each other well based on this promise of life after death. It changes our life before death, especially beginning with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So what does it look like for us to comfort our fellow believers instead of condemning them or criticizing them? What would it look like for us to love our fellow believers instead of labeling them as being with that group or that denomination or whatever, just to love each other? You know, I think our cancel culture world could stand for some compassion these days. You with me, church? Remember, our love towards someone else, remember, it's not an agreement or a statement of affirmation on everything that they say or do or the way they live their lives. No, it's simply seeing someone else the way that God sees that person. Try it this week. Who's that person who it's very hard for you to love? <laughs> you can just say a silent prayer. God, help me see this person the way you see them. Don't tell them that's what you're doing because it ruins it. I'm trying to see you right now the way God sees you, but you're so irritating. You got to keep that part in your head. <laughs> One day this week, I got to listen in uh, while my wife Ashley was working from home. Part of her job, it can involve phone calls uh, with people who are sometimes very upset, um, confused, scared, angry, sad, grieving. And this emotion, it can manifest itself sometimes in just outright hostility toward Ashley. I listened from the other room, though, as she brought Romans 14 to life and the way she interacted with clients, with patience, with gentleness, and with a quiet confidence. I listened at moments in amazement as she helped stressed out, confused people find stability and get some reassurance. She treated every person, at least the ones I heard, with dignity and with respect, patiently listening to questions, and in all of it, seeking to understand what was kind of driving the worry and the frustration. So that's what it looks like for a paralegal, to love others well in the normal course of her job. So how about you? What does that look like for you? To bring Romans 14 to life, to love how about your household, people you live with, starting with them? What would it look like this week for you to love your household well? How about your friends, people you work with, neighbors? Maybe there's a neighbor you don't even know their name yet. Maybe that could be a job this week. It's just to try to even learn what their name is and introduce yourself to a neighbor that you don't yet know, your students, your patients, your customers. See, the gift of eternal life, it means that we can love others well. And here's number two, eternal life now, it means that I can live courageously. Live courageously. Would you say that out loud? Go. Live courageously. Let's look at some of Paul's words again. This time I'm taking us to a letter he wrote to the Christ followers, not in Rome, but in Corinth. So he says this. Let me read for us 
a passage. This is from 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, but Paul's not done. Verse 58. So my dear brothers and sisters, see what he's doing here. See eternal life then. It changes the way we live our lives now. Dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Always work enthusiastically. Why is Paul calling us to this kind of life? Because we have victory over death itself. Our victory comes from Jesus. It, it, it sets us free to the point that Paul even has the courage to mock death to its face. Where's your sting, buddy? Where's your victory? It's gone. You've already lost the battle. It's not an ongoing fight. It's a fight that's already been finished. I peeked ahead to the ending. It's called Revelation. God spoils the ending for us. And in the end, the love of God wins the life, the God of life, the God of the living. He wins. Death has been defeated. No more sting. We have this victory, and so it changes the way we can live free. We can live liberated. We can love others well, and we can live with so much courage. This is what was on display, this courage that a guy named Brant John displayed in a Texas courtroom in October of 2019. Brant John is the brother of Botham John. Young man, he was a gifted singer and worship leader at his church. He was tragically shot and killed in his own home by Amber Geiger. She had mistakenly, in a confused moment, entered Botham's apartment, thinking it was her apartment, and she thought he was an intruder. She shot and killed him. The case was covered extensively. I'm sure you saw it all over the news. Amber Geiger ended up being sentenced to serve 10 years in prison for the murder. But at the sentencing hearing, something shocking happened. Brant, Botham's brother, came to the witness stand to deliver a victim impact statement directly to his brother's killer. And afterward, after getting permission from the judge, they collapsed into an embrace and wept. See a picture of that moment on the screen. Let's leave that picture on the screen. I want to read to you part of what Brant said to Amber. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself, and I forgive you. And I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not going to say, I hope that you rot and die like my brother did. I personally want the best for you. I want the best for you because I know that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be this. Give your life to Christ. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Friends, how does the brother of an innocent man shot in his own apartment look his brother's killer in the eyes and say, I forgive you? He does that because of the gift of eternal life that Brant knows he has now and also forever. He teaches us what it looks like to love others well, even in the face of death. He shows us how to live courageously, even in the face of death. It's not just a calling on Brant's life. It's a calling on yours and mine, too. So once again, God offers you today the gift of eternal life with him now and forever. Would you say yes to that gift and receive it today? And if for you, maybe there's a next step. Maybe you want to go public with that decision and with that commitment and be baptized. I'd be honored to help you do that. At the end of the service, I'll be up here. Pastor George will be in the back. That's my friend Stacy. 
I was like, maybe you could be up here too. So Stacy and George and I will just be around uh, to meet with you. Maybe if you're watching on the chat right now and you want to go public with that decision and that commitment, you can, you can redeem your phone or your laptop for Christ. <laughs> you can just simply type in, I say yes. I say yes today. And we'll start praying for you this week. Maybe a next step for you is to get in a group. We've got these online groups coming together. And maybe for you, you're ready to kind of go beyond what we do here on Sunday mornings and start to journey life on life with other brothers and sisters in Christ, to love others well, to live with great courage. And so we wrap up today. We all have a next step that we're going to take because uh, we're going to move from God's word to God's table. And we're going to share Holy Communion together. Pastor George, would you come on up? And uh, communion means many things. One of them, though, that's especially appropriate for today The Bible says that communion gives us a foretaste, a glimpse of the banquet table of heaven where there's room for all of us, where the ground is level at the foot of the cross, where Jesus is the host and you and I are his invited, honored guests. And so I want to invite you, uh, if you're watching online, now would be the time if you happen to have bread and juice nearby uh, to grab that. If you're here with us in the room, I want to remind you that Uh, communion here at Crossroad, Um, this table is open to all of you. So adults, children, regardless of maybe your religious background, whether you're a member of our church or not, Holy Communion here is for every single one of us who want to experience the goodness, the grace, the forgiveness of God uh, today. And so if you're here for the first time, hopefully you got one of these communion kits. If you do not, you can lift a hand right now We'll have a volunteer bring it to you. Uh, These kids just want you to know that the juice is in the bottom, and at the top there's a little compartment that has a wafer um, inside of it. And then uh, we're going to need a communion kit right up here in the front. Grady, if you lift your hand up again, if someone could bring him a communion kit, um, that'd be great. Um, Maybe uh, Don and Connie, could you grab a communion kit for me? Or There we go, right? Susan's bringing it. Thanks. Uh, Pastor George is going to say a prayer for communion for us, and then he's going to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. And then after that, he's going to invite all of us uh, to take and eat, and to take and drink. So, George, would you lead us? In the Old Testament, Isaiah 43, God says, You are precious in my sight, and honored, and I love you. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Do you believe this? On the night before Jesus would willingly give up his earthly life to pay God's penalty for the sins that we commit by omission and commission and by mistake, Jesus died for our sins and the sins of everyone in the world. Do you believe this? On that night, he was with his close friends, even the one who would betray him. And he loved them, even the one who betrayed him. That's love, God's love. And with his love, Jesus blessed them. And on the third day after this night, Jesus rose from death to life again to show his friends and us that there is life after death. Do you believe this? And Jesus was seen alive again by over 500 eyewitnesses. 500 people saw him alive again. Do you believe this? And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And then he took a cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of heaven. Do you believe this? And if you do, please say amen. Heavenly Father, make this be for us the bread of life and the cup of salvation. Take and eat the body of our Lord Jesus, broken for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together with you and with each other. And bless us now in our faith, in our hope for the future, and in the love that you promise us and that you give us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to sing one more song together and uh, then, then we'll be done. So I would invite you, if you're able, let's stand together. Let's worship and lift our voices to heaven as we surrender ourselves to the care, to the salvation, to the love of God, who is the God of life, who is the God of the living. Let's sing.
It's been great to worship together uh, today. If you want to partner with Crossroad Church and invest in what God is doing uh, through us, uh, you can uh, give a contribution anytime uh, online at crossroad.church. Uh, we also have giving boxes by the exits. Thank you so much uh, for, your, for your financial uh, support. Also um, want to encourage you to jump into one of our groups uh, that we're kicking off this month that are meeting online. And now before you leave, would you receive this blessing? My brothers and sisters in Christ, May the God of life, the God of the living, may he fill your heart today with the hope, the joy, the promise of resurrection, of eternal life, life to the full with no end. And may it change the way that you live your life today. May your eternal life start not with your last breath, but with your next breath. May you leave this place to love others well and to live courageously as you go out to share this good news to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. It's in his name we pray, everyone said. Amen. Go in peace.